Hello everyone and welcome to this lunchtime masterclass session hosted by Family Building Society. I'm Nick Cheek, Managing Editor at Mortgage Solutions. In today's masterclass we'll be discussing the opportunities in the late life lending market. Now just because it's Halloween today, getting older and needing extra funds shouldn't be spooking your clients. And although challenges exist in the market, which we will discuss, older borrowers shouldn't fear using the equity they have built up in the property. That said, the late life market, like so much of the mortgage sector, is in a state of flux at present. Recent figures have shown that lending is down this year, but it should be noted that this is on the back of a record 2022. In addition, there was a recent probe by the FCA into the market, which found that standards need to be raised in certain parts of the sector. However, the report also noted that improvements had and were being made and that advisors and lenders in the later life sector had embraced consumer duty. And one of the keys to that improvement has been education, which is very much the thrust behind this session today. Among other aspects, we'll be exploring overcoming challenges, examining different income and how it can be used, and the importance of using standard mortgage products rather than rushing immediately to equity release. I'm joined today by Darren Deacon, Head of Intermediary Sales, and Nathan Wallen, Waller, Business Development Manager at Family Building Society. Now, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session, so we'd really appreciate your questions. If you want to submit a question, click the question tab on the left-hand side of the screen. And so without further ado, I will hand you over to Darren and Nathan to kick off the session. Thank you, Darren, Nathan. Okay, well, um, thanks very much, Nick, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Darren Deacon. Um, I am Head of Intermediary Sales for Family Building Society. Um, and as Nick said there, uh, today we have our East of England BDM, Nathan Waller. Uh, so yeah, between us, we will look at the opportunities uh, in the later life market and ways that Family Building Society can assist. So as you can see there, we feel that education is key. Um, this is especially felt in the later life market. So by the end of this presentation, um, I hope that you'll have a great understanding of the size of the sector and also see how we can assist with uh, utilizing passive incomes, uh, offer bespoke manual underwriting, um, and just explain how a standard mortgage can be used as an alternative to equity release or some other lifetime mortgage. So, um, Family Building Society, just a bit of background of, of ourselves. Uh, we've been around for over 125 years and we are known as a later life specialist. As I said there earlier, we uh, manually underwrite every single one of our mortgage applications. So therefore, each case that comes to us uh, usually has a story attached to it. So a little later on, following myself, Nathan will cover our USPs and go into a bit more detail about ways that we can help with your later life customers, maybe bring that to life. So just moving into this slide here, I just wanted to highlight the market potential. Um, and as many of you know, uh, we have an aging population. So if you can just focus on the, the green shaded areas, you'll see the, the, the top shaded area. And what that shows is the biggest population growth in 2020 was between the ages of 57 and 72. And what it also shows is the, the green shaded bit underneath is that the largest growth area is predicted to be by 2030 between the ages of 75 and 87. So as we can see, it definitely is an aging population. And it's also interesting to note that there's going to be around or there are around 21 million people who are over the age of 55 currently in the UK. And this is set to rise to just shy of 24 million by 2030. So hopefully this, this slide and that graph will demonstrate the size of, and the potential of the market. As many of these people, obviously going into their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even to their 80s, will still need a mortgage or some other form of borrowing. The next slide also, again, illustrates the opportunity now, if you can just see at the bottom there, there's a circle and that circle in red. And that just emphasizes uh, the biggest expectation of age growth by 2045. And that is for people going into pension age. So again, demonstrating the size 
of the of the sector. Now we know that COVID uh, had an impact on lending in general, as uh, as Nick alluded to, and we know that later life lending uh, was not immune to that, certainly for people over the ages of 55. But we did see this bounce back in 2021 when there were more than 187,000 new mortgages um, with, with total borrowing of over 28 billion. And this actually saw the highest volume of lending to over 55s since 2014. And what we also see with recent data is that four out of five mortgages for older borrowers is done via a standard mortgage. So often was the case that people believed that a lifetime mortgage was the only available option. But in 2023, uh, we've seen a, a stagnation or even a reduction in the sale of products. And UK finance data shows that over 30,000 standard mortgages were advanced to older borrowers in quarter two of this year, as opposed to slightly over 7,000 lifetime mortgages. So you can see the disparity between a standard mortgage and a lifetime mortgage. And what you'll also note from that as well is that there are only 285 Rio mortgages that were sold in this period. And I will touch on Rio mortgages a little bit later on. But there's one stat there that I just wanted to point out to you um, is that later life borrowing or at least mortgages that extend into retirement now makes up 60 percent of all residential lending. So a big opportunity there for you business writers. This slide uh, shows the volume of lending specifically to the later life ages range. So you can see hopefully at the top there that the highest level of mortgage borrowing in the later life space were people between the ages of 55 and 59. It then drops um, over the next two age categories, but it jumps up again for the age range of 70 plus. This slide shows the customer's ages at the end of the mortgage term. And the largest area of where people are uh, finishing their mortgages is between the age of 65 and 74. So again, demonstrating the requirement for later life lending options where borrowers have perhaps needed to extend their mortgage term. Um, maybe this is due to a major life event, maybe through a death. Uh, divorce or loss of job. So the, the, the this necessity to extend that mortgage um, beyond what we would normally class as their, their standard retirement age. So as I mentioned earlier, we talked about, uh, we looked at Rio mortgages um, and we saw how Rio mortgages um, in particular uh, were, were down in, in the general later life space. So in fact, these were launched by the FCA in March 2018. And whether we, you know or not, but uh, sales have been very, very poor on this particular product. So poor, in fact, that the FCA predicted that by 2021, there would be at least 21,000 Rio mortgages being sold each year. When in actual fact, there's only been around 9,000 in, in total that have been sold to date, as I say, since March 2018. So as a later life lender, we have a Rio product. But the main issue with them is where you have to apply the death stress. So this is the requirement to show that the mortgage is affordable in either name should one person pass away. And this is often the reason why these cases fall down. But one consolation to us is that many of these Rio cases, well, they will still fit as a standard residential interest only mortgage. Um, so we're happy to, to look at these as we do in great volume. We looked at um, areas where people and examples of why people will be looking to take a mortgage into later life. As I say, major life events as through, as I said before, divorce or death. Um, but there are other reasons why people want to take a, a mortgage into retirement. Um, that they're given there on, on the slide. And I think the thing to take from that is that many people are not ready um, for the traditional pipe and slippers. They want to use their homes to benefit their families and even their own lifestyles. Um, and, and again, there's, there's many, many 
reasons and many, many options that we can provide for these later life customers. So to put it into context, there is a staggering 700,000 interest only mortgages and 220,000 part and part mortgages that need repaying by retirement age. So again, emphasize the opportunity in the market. Many of these people obviously need the correct advice. So in fact, mortgage debt for the over 65s has increased from 20 billion in 2017 and it's predicted to nearly double to just under 40 million by 2030. So lifetime mortgages were often assumed to be the primary vehicle for borrowers over 65, but as we know, they're not always right for all. And the final slide for me is uh, it's from Criteria Brain, which shows the top 25 searches, and you can see that two of those are for max age limits. So again, it's a reflection of the market that many, many advisors are, are turning to Criteria Brain with customers that are, have a need and requirement for that later life lending. Okay, um, that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. I will now hand you back over to Nathan. He will explain some more specifics of other areas where we can assist. Thank you, Darren. Um, some really interesting facts and figures there, and uh, I think that really does show um, how big a, a market uh, this is. And um, even really, if you kind of go back to one of the previous slides where we were talking about the reason that's driving later life lending, um, quite an interesting statistic that uh, I saw from uh, from This Is Money, when you kind of go back to the bank of mum and dad and uh, the bank of granny and granddad and things like that, is they're looking at bringing in about 8.1 billion pounds to the market this year, which is huge, a huge amount of figures, uh, a huge amount of money there. And it really does, again, show how this type of market is growing. It's not just later life for the customers and their needs for their own mortgages, but it's also providing assistance um, across the generations, really. Um, and really, again, is it's really that joined up approach between the brokers, the clients there and their, and their families. So, so let's have a little bit of a talk in regards to the challenges. Now, from a lender's perspective, it has been a very, very tricky, uh, tricky time. Um, as we're all probably aware, purchase business has slowed um, and really keeping existing customers on our books has really been key. Uh, to kind of keep the business flowing and uh, uh, and things like that. And where we really needed to look at attracting clients on remortgage business, uh, keeping them on our product transfers, um, we're trying to be as flexible and understanding as we possibly can to really kind of attract that additional business. And where we are looking at rates, ultimately, we've been trying to do what we can, and every lender really has been trying to do what they can. Um, to assist you and your customers, but the swap rates really have had a huge impact on the pricing, which has really kind of helped drive client behaviours and what they're looking for and, uh, and what they're looking to do as well. Um, and as you as the broker will no doubt have noticed, um, affordability has got tighter in general. Um, with the increase of cost of living, with the increase of cost of funding, ONS data is being amended and changed. Um, the background stresses that we as a lender have to apply to make sure the mortgage is affordable, not just now, but also in the future, um, has obviously gone up. So that's one of the reasons why you are seeing that affordability has become tighter with lenders um, and why you've seen a lot of fluctuations um, in rate increases and product changes over the last few years, which we are now beginning to see drop down and things begin to bit a bit, get a bit more calmer for the meantime. Um, but really that kind of falls onto the customers. Um, they've been concerned, they've been worried about it. Ultimately, they are the people that are paying this mortgage and um, I think there's a little bit of concern from them as to what they're gonna do now and also moving forward uh, to keep those mortgage costs cheap enough for them to be affordable or to maybe change their situation, changing to things to interest only, maybe extending to terms, maybe needing a bit more of an, a manual approach to their individual case and circumstances because where it was just as simple as putting a case through uh, an affordability calculator or maybe just putting it through a dip process and the computer saying yes and no, 
we're really needing to look at these cases in a bit more of a manual approach to really understand what is going on um, and also what's going to be happening in the future um, to really maybe extend that term or to go into the later life market and that sector um, or look at using what they've built up over the last few years and where some lenders may only kind of cap out at 70 or 75. Um, that's not necessarily the right approach for everybody. Um, and we'll come on to our policies and criteria and the terms that we can look to assist people with, um, which have, kind of shows really where we fit in. Um, but really the, 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 biggest, the biggest thing to overcome these kind of challenges in this market is the education of it all. Um, more people are lending into retirement, as we've seen from the figures. We do have an aging population. People are, are looking to keep their mortgage debt sooner for a multitude of different reasons. It could be, as I said, the bank of mum and dad raising that money to give to their sons, their grandkids to, to support them in what they want to do. It might be they want to keep a debt on their more, uh, on their property for the foreseeable future um, to maybe assist with inheritance tax planning um, or to, to look after that. Or they might be looking at diversifying their own income streams. They might be looking to invest in some buy-to-lets and things like that as well in the future and raising that capital, buying that outright, um, or even with a small mortgage to give them a better quality of life in the future because the pensions market has changed significantly. Um, they're gone are the, as many of the defined um, benefit pensions that they used to be. Um, and we're looking at all these other different pension schemes. And this is really where, as, a, as an advisor, I'm finding that this is the key time when an advisor really does help their clients through the current situations that we are in. Um, gone are the days of just being a broker market of just simply putting the figures in, there you go, off, move forward, we'll worry about it in two or five years time when your mortgage is due for renewal. It's now advising them of their circumstances as they stand today and potentially what they're doing in the future. So how many of you look at what pension provisions your clients have? Do you understand them? There's so many different schemes out there. Do they have a state pension? When are they going to get it? Do you know where the client can go to to get this information up front, such as the government gateway? Do they have a defined benefit or a defined contribution pension? Do they have a SIP? Do they have a SAS? Do you know when they can claim on it or when they can start drawing it down from? How do they do that? Do they have a wealth advisor that might be dealing with them? Do they have um, in their own employment based pension. And what if things do go wrong later in life? Rio, as we mentioned there, the main thing that stops some of these cases from proceeding is the death stresses and the additional underwrite that needs to be done where you are looking at the worst case scenario of what if one of these clients were to pass away. So understanding what would happen at the at, if that was to happen will help you guide and educate your customer. And it will be as simple as looking at the pension schemes, pension details, looking through it, and really getting a clear understanding as you as the advisor again as to what their circumstances are. I think you would also be very surprised how many customers that you might deal with that actually don't necessarily understand it themselves as well. And I'm sure they'll be very appreciative of you taking the time to look through it with them and guide it, guide them through their circumstances. Now, we're not looking at you being tax advisors or inheritance tax planners or anything like that, but it's just understanding what they've got in the background and even maybe referring them to a tax advisor or a wealth manager to really plan for that moving forward as well, which I'm sure they'll be appreciative of. Um, same thing for investments. Um, now, we're not necessarily just talking about, well, have they got loads of money sitting and they decided to invest in Apple or Microsoft or anything such as that. But there are a multitude of different investment strategies that are out there, such as company stocks, like we mentioned. Um, they can be looking at investing on the uh, on the FTSE or they could be looking at just investing in uh, in other large companies within the UK. They might just have a fund that has a spread of different investments within it. Um, which is normally geared towards their risk appetite. They might have ISAs, uh, they might have bonds, 
They might have a multitude of different things and a few little bits of money dotted away in lots of different places. And understanding again what they are planned for and what that is for, uh, what they can utilize it for later on, is also going to help. Buy to lets, um, again, another form really of a lot of people's retirement planning. They have built up a portfolio of properties. That was their pension. That was what's going to draw, give them an income later on in life when they want to retire and give them um, extra money to, to go on a holiday or uh, to provide uh, additional income so they can have a new car each year, even when they've retired and things like that. And it's, again, understanding the nature of how these are structured and where they are. Well, are they in personal names? Are they being shown on an SA302? Can you see what their mortgage payments are if they have any on those properties as well? Um, what is the structure and their plan long term for them? Is it in a limited company in an SPV? Are they actually drawing the income from that limited company or are they like some of them that we are finding, actually just filtering that money into that into that company portfolio. They are not needing to draw on that income at this moment in time because they're still working or they don't need the additional money and they're just seeing that money actually add in and roll up. Again, depending on the lender that you speak to, that could ultimately become an income stream now or in the future. So if we are looking at an affordability shortfall, then maybe this could be used to top it up. And I've also thrown SASs in there as well, um, purely because there's a lot of company directors and they do have um, company pension schemes that they've set up between them and maybe they bought the, the, the building that they are currently in, they're renting it from themselves um, or they might be subletting some of, the, some of the parts of the building to other people and that's within their pension scheme that is drawing in a rental income, which again, helps provide a retirement income later on in life because chances are when that business retires, they've got two options. They can either sell that property and that cash go into the SaaS or they can just continue to rent it out to a different firm um, and that rent can continue later on in life as well. Now, I've added at the bottom here a section for limited company directors. Now, I know we are talking about later life lending here. Um, and normally when you look at this type of thing, limited company directors would lead you to thinking about your, your standard customers, maybe in their normal uh, kind of ages of life. Um, but what's worth looking at, if you are dealing with limited company directors, are you reading the full accounts or are you just looking at the SA302s for their salary and dividend? What you may or may not be aware of when you look through the company accounts is you can scroll through all the different expenses that that business has, including the director's salary, including the, the, the dividends that are payable. But where you are getting good quality businesses and good quality customers and good quality accountants and tax advisors, more and more you are seeing pensions being put in for the directors. So you might go through the company accounts and you might see a director's pension payment of 25 grand. Now, depending on the lender that you're looking at, depending on what the client's looking at doing, there are two things there. First of all, you know they've got a pension scheme they're paying into. So you can have a conversation with them, say, can I see a copy of that pension? Can I see what's in there? How long have you been contributing to it for? They may have only just started over the last couple of years, um, but what they might also look at is go, well, I've been doing this for the last 10, 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden, that pension scheme is potentially gonna be utilized for a retirement later on, which again can help you extend a mortgage term past standard retirement ages. Or you might even be able to, depending on the lender, be able to add that pension contribution back in, in the same way that you might do for an employed customer. So where your client might be looking at a case at the moment, go, oh, unfortunately, the affordability doesn't fit, because my salary and dividends or my salary and share of profit doesn't quite fit the affordability models that that lender's applying now, as soon as you then add in another 25 grand's worth of potential income, all of a sudden that case fits and can really help you place that case that you thought you might have struggled with in the first place. Also, it will tell you the company structure. It will tell you the shareholders. It will tell you the directors of that business. Um, and what if your customers that you're dealing with are actually passive directors? What if their sons or daughters are already running that business 
without really a huge amount of input from your customer and that accountant is willing to confirm that is the case, then all of a sudden, well, they're not actively involved in that day-to-day -day running of that business. They, in fact, it's all running completely without their input whatsoever at this moment. So then that business can be shown to be sustainable without the client's input, which again could potentially lead you to looking at a nice long mortgage term using the business profits or their shareholding and salary, whatever they're drawing from that business for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, up to potentially the age of 95 as an example. So it's that kind of thing where when you're looking at a customer's individual circumstances, if you're not asking the questions, you don't know the answers, and that could potentially cost you and the client a significant amount of money um, in regards to bad advice or not really looking at what the best option for them is. Okay, so hopefully that understands, uh, that, that kind of explains to you why education and really getting to grips with this marketplace, I think is ultimately very, very important. Now, coming on to us as a lender, um, as we've already mentioned, we do a huge amount of lending in and into retirement. Um, it's one of our mainstays of business. Um, we don't credit score. Um, we look at the credit file um, and we base an individual assessment on that. We don't believe that really we should be dictated to by a computer to say who we should and shouldn't lend to. Life events happen, um, and especially when you're dealing with some of the later life customers, they don't always necessarily have a huge amount on credit and a huge amount on finance. And just because they don't score enough points doesn't mean we shouldn't be lending to these customers if they've got the means to maintain and pay this mortgage moving forward. So flexible underwriting as well, we'll look at each case individually and I'll kind of show you an example of that in a little bit. Um, and us as the BDM team, we have huge relationships with our underwriters. Um, we speak to them on a daily basis um, and we can look at a whole amount of different things prior to actually submitting the case, which saves you time and and effort and ultimately hopefully gives you and your customer that little bit of confidence that you discuss the case up front with us before you've even submitted it to give them that little bit more comfort that things will go through. Um, and when it comes to our criteria, um, and it falls back really into where the education part here is key, is the vast majority of cases that we do see either from high street customers come into the end of the line with the existing lender, got good income later in life, and the high street is simply saying, no, not interested, yeah, we'll take your earned income to 70, maybe 75, oh, but that pension that you're not drawing down at the moment, you know what, no, we don't like that. Um, that state pension that you're gonna take in a couple of years time, oh, we can't consider that. Um, we're only going to take your earned income. Well, that doesn't necessarily, as we mentioned, really fit for, for everybody. So we will look at owner-occupier repayment mortgage. So standard mortgages, not equity release, just a normal residential mortgage that you would sell on a general day-to-day -day basis up to the age of 95 at the end of the term. If they've got the income to support it, why wouldn't you? And from our back book and from how we see things being managed in, in the background of our, of our society, we tend to find this is always managed very well. Um, but if you kind of go back to what we mentioned about COVID, those that had retirement and guaranteed incomes or pensions or investments or SITs or SASs, they didn't see their job stop straight away. They didn't have to worry about COVID grants, job retention schemes, all these other different things that were thrown at to try and help them survive. They didn't lose their business that they were working for. All of a sudden didn't have to shut up shop and close their doors and they had to find another job. These customers had good quality income and actually could help pay things for the, for, for the foreseeable. So why not look to consider them? Interest only, another bit of a, it's, it's another one of those where it's fit for the right customers. Interest only, same as equity release, has been kind of covered by a bit of a, an overall generic badge of whether this be right or wrong. Look at the client's individual circumstances. Base it on their individual situation. Does that make sense to them? Is it the right advice? If so, let's look at it. Um, and so we can look up to the age of 89 uh, from when the loan commences for these types of cases as well. Now, when it comes to the earned income, um, we will look at 
up to the age of 70. If they're non-manual, we can go to 75, not a problem. Now, where we really kind of look at building the individual scenario to the case is the pension pots, fixed pensions, company salary and dividends. We look at pension funds, if it's a SIP um, or an investment or anything like that, we look at 90% of that current fund value as it stands today. And then we look at dividing it over the mortgage term that we need to. We again, build it around that client's individual circumstances. And where we looked at rental and investments, as we've covered the investment side, but on the rental, if it's on an SA302 or if it's going into a limited company or it's going into a SaaS, that is a passive income that that client can draw on for as long as they need to, or worst case, they can get rid of that investment um, or asset later on. So another main area for later life lending, especially for things like Rio and for things like equity release, is that might be the right plan for them, but they might need something slightly higher on the loan to value side. We'll go up to 80% loan to value on all cases, whether it be um, a normal first time buyer, whether it be somebody looking at lending into retirement, using their income to support it. Um, so for standard capital and interest mortgages, for standard interest only mortgages, and for standard um, first time buyer mortgages, 80%, not a problem. Um, and the parents and grandkids where we mentioned the bank of mum and dad, if we're looking at things like joint borrow sole proprietor, they can again come on to assist with their son or their, their son or grandchild's mortgage um, and boost their borrowing up today by utilizing their retirement income so that they can get in a nicer, better quality home from day one. So rather than buying a one bed flat, that could mean them buying a two bed house. And what that will do long term is save them from selling that property, paying all the estate agency costs, all the solicitor costs and all that kind of stuff um, just to upsize in two or three years time. So actually long term, yes, they are taking a larger debt, but they are saving themselves a significant amount of money by jumping that first hurdle of the ladder of a flat straight to a house. So again, that's the families really helping each other out. Yes, we do offer Rio mortgages um, for applicants over 55. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, uh, the main kind of caveat to that is we need to look at the worst case scenario of the worst possible income. And really what we end up tending to do is standard interest only. Because again, as I mentioned, we can go up to 80% loan to value with a suitable repayment vehicle in place. Normally that sale of a buy to let or sale of a second home up to 80%. We can consider downsizing as, a, as an acceptable repayment vehicle. We will limit that to 70%, um, but we don't set a minimum equity requirement of that property because again, each individual client circumstances are completely different. If you only need £100,000 to downsize to a one bed retirement flat, that's what equity you will require to downsize. Obviously different areas of the country are gonna be completely different. So again, we build it around the individual customer. And like some of the areas where or some of the other lenders where you might find interest only has um, a kind of a caveat of you need to earn X amount of money. Um, yes, there is an affordability assessment. We're not just going to look at it and say, well, we'll lend you loads and loads and loads of money because it's on interest only. It will have an affordability assessment on it. And if they can afford it, they can have it. And we will do an interest only stress on a mortgage term of 10 years or less. So that gives your client that little bit more comfort that in 10 years, for the next 10 years, their mortgage is protected. They can continue on an interest only basis without too much of a problem. Okay. Now, what I wanted to look at here is we've gone through quite a bit of information and I just wanted to kind of bring some of it to life um, of a customer where they've got a few different incomes moving on into their later life. They've got a state pension currently at 10,600. They do have a buy to let property in the background that's worth 250,000, which is giving them just, just over nine and a half grand's worth of, uh, of rental income um, that can be evidenced by our NSA 302. Now, where we tend to get the majority of the cases and where we can be very, very flexible is if I've come onto the SIP value. So I know I've got SIP there, um, but it would be the same as if the client had an investment vehicle. 
So if they've got stocks or shares or investments or anything like that, it would be exactly the same. But um, based on this kind, I've just covered it down as a, as a SIP. Um, we look at the fund value and we take 90% of that. So that gives you a usable fund value of £270,000. What we then do is we then divide that over the mortgage term that that client is looking to do. So if they wanted a 20 year mortgage term, we'd divide that by 20, gives a usable income of 13 and a half thousand pounds a year. Now that might be perfectly fine for what they need to do and to kind of get the level of borrowing that they need. And that's all, all fine. What they might actually want to do is actually, you know what, I might need that a little bit more, or we might need to change that kind of affordability model ever so slightly to get them to the goals they want to do. They might want to give more money to the kids or grandkids and really boost their own um, circumstances. So what they might want to do is say, well, I don't want to do it over 20 years. I'm quite happy to do it over 10 years. Then we divide that same fund by 10. So as you can see, just by looking at that customer and by just looking at their circumstances in a different way, you've got a significant amount of difference when it comes to the actual mortgage, uh, well, the actual income that we can use to support that mortgage. Now, again, they might not need 47 grand's worth of income. They might only need 33. So in that case, we just extend the term again. And want, they can borrow that money over a longer period of time, making their monthly payments cheaper. Or, as we've mentioned earlier, it could be a joint borrower sole proprietor where they might be assisted in their sons, daughters, grandkids, and actually a 20 year term might be more beneficial for them because they want to in, kind of have their mortgage term over as long as possible as well. And on top of that, that buy to let property can be utilized as either a part of an exit for an interest only case, um, or that could be the exit. They could sell their main residence and move into their unencumbered buy to let. That client's individual circumstances can be looked at a multitude of different ways. And we as the, uh, as the BDM team, are always happy to run through these types of cases and scenarios and to really help you provide the best possible advice uh, to, to your customers. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor of us as a lender and the challenges that you found within the market and then the understanding of why this area of the market is becoming more and more important to more and more people's um, business and a clearer understanding um, of, of how you can help. Um, any questions? Um, I'll pass you uh, pass you back to to Nick. Yeah, thank you very much, Darren. Thank you very much, Nathan. That was a great presentation. I think really informative, very chunky. I think the viewers um, have got a lot out of it. Now we have got um, a few questions through, but uh, obviously, please keep sending them. Please keep sending any more uh, as you come through. I think there's probably a lot of questions to come through from that. So, first one, first question that we have um, actually for uh, Darren and Nathan is simple one, really. Well, I'm sure it's that simple, but do you accept mortgage prisoners? Um, I'll I'll jump on that one um, just just quickly. Um, so, yes, when it comes to mortgage prisoners, it depends on what people are looking at and what they would, would deem as a mortgage prisoner. More and more people now are in that circumstance where the lender said, yes, we will lend to you up to maybe 70 as, as a guide. Um, and when they've got to that age, they've gone, oh, well, I can still afford my mortgage. But you're saying no. Um, we'll look at those. We'll base it on the individual uh, client circumstances. Um, and really kind of build that case around them where they might have the pensions and the investments and the income. Also, affordability is that little bit tighter and that client might be able to demonstrate they've maintained that mortgage for a long period of time. And actually, although the affordability model may say they can't quite afford it, it might only be an ever so slight stretch on their income to actually say yes, they can, they can do it. So yeah, we can look at those and we're always happy as the BDM team to consider those. Um, and we say what the existing lender might class as a mortgage prisoner, we might turn around and go, actually, that's just our day to day. That's just what we do. So yeah, talk to us about it and let's, uh, let's see what we can look at. Interesting, interesting. Let's see, we've actually got some more questions coming through now as well. So let's quickly grab one of those. Um, 
So uh, we've also been asked, or we'll ask you guys, uh, how many applicants or incomes do you or can you consider? Um, I'll take that one, Nick. I, I don't know if I'm having problems with my microphone. Let me know if if, um, if it's coming through that way. Um, yeah, we can take four. Okay, we can take um, four applicants and four incomes. Um, so it can come in a variety of uh, different scenarios. So we we do lots of joint borrower sole proprietor, uh, whereby parents and grandparents can assist their their children or grandchildren. And obviously that's where we come into play because of the uh, the, the later life because we can lend to age 95. Um, and and in general, uh, just as a standard mortgage, so it doesn't have to be a joint borrower sole proprietor. Uh, you could have four adults so their their parents and their older working age children on the uh, on the mortgage living in the property and uh, yes we can take all four uh, applicants and all four incomes excellent can i just ask a question on the back of that actually we do have some more it's a very quick one do you find that your customers um and people come to you do they actually know about sort of uh, the JB, uh, the JBSP mortgages. Do they do they have that kind of education, or is there sort of more needed on that? Do you think? Well, I, I think as as a product, it certainly has gained momentum uh, from from when it was first talked about. I don't know, maybe four four to five years ago, uh, and it certainly has evolved. Um, but as as with everything, um, there's. Uh, there's there's more education that's needed. I mean, as a, as a, as a, as I just said there, the, the fact that we can go deeper into retirement um, over and above certainly many of the high street lenders puts us at an advantage um, when we're when we're looking at those those mortgages where they're bringing on a parent who might be into their fifties and sixties, and in most cases they are, and their terms can be restricted. You know, maybe that high street lender will, will take on that joint borrower sole proprietor. But you might only get a term to age 70, 75, 80 even. But as I say, we, we, could, we, can, go, we can go far beyond that. Um, I mean, I, funny, I did see something today, and the Skipton are now calling it the income booster um, mortgage, which essentially is, is, is the same, um, whether it's it, rebranding it once again. But, but all in all, the joint borrower sole proprietor, it, it's there. When, when we, look at those, we look at those situations where, um, you know, as I say, the first time buyer, Typically, you know, they're, they're nearly there to get to get that mortgage. Um, and that's where the broker can then just ask those additional questions to see, look, they can't quite afford where where they need to be. Can they bring a parent or a grandparent or a wider family member even onto that mortgage to make it more affordable? Yeah. And, and I think kind of jumping on the back of that a little bit is part of it is the market changing as well. Um, where house prices have gone up, maybe as we've seen with a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of businesses, and uh, we've seen a lot of strikes of it, where the co incomes haven't kept up um, with everything else that's been going higher and higher and higher. And also, there's people's circumstances change. Um, they might decide actually they've been to uh, people have separated and actually they want to keep a property and they can't afford it on their own because they took a joint four and a half times income mortgage out at that point and they've lost half or a third or two thirds of that income stream and they want to stay there. The parents before might have turned around and said, well, we can't really do anything to help. But these, or if they did, stamp duty might have been the, the main crippling factor because it's a big bill when you add the extra 3% surcharge on it. And they go, actually, you know what? This might be the right solution. Saves them a couple of quid um, on the on tax, tax bill and also helps their son, daughter and things keeping that property. The other thing, we find it the other way around. So some of the older clients that have their incomes have changed and unfortunately wouldn't pass things like a mortgage prisoner side of things where they might thought their only option is an equity release or the, or their LTV is too high on that or they're too young to do it. The kids are coming on and helping the parents to keep them in their home as well. So it, it does go both ways. Interesting. Yeah. Well, another couple, and actually a, a, a question related to that um, and uh, being asked. So, can a joint borrower sole proprietor be in the name of parent, child, and child's partner? And the um, the viewer actually very honestly nice please as well. So they really want to know the answer. So that's a, so. Can joint borrower sole proprietor be in the name of parent, child, and yeah. child's partner? So, yeah. So, so 
but yeah, we can look at each, each case is individual. Everyone's circumstances are different. Uh, the main thing that we are looking for, generally speaking, is those that are, are living in the property. Generally speaking, are the ones that are on the mortgage and the title, because mm-hmm. ultimately it's their property, it's where they're going to be living. Um, and then they're assisted with somebody else who's living elsewhere. And they're the people that don't want to go on the title, but also want to be named on the mortgage. Um, so that's generally how you see things. So a three-way mortgage such as that um, is perfectly fine. Um, yeah. Ultimately, it depends on the current circumstances. And we're always happy to, to have a chat about it. Okay. Um, this is a pretty lengthy and specific question but i will um i hope you guys can answer it you are the experts after all so we've been asked uh is there an appetite to go outside the maximum loan advised by the calculator if it is a pound for pound remortgage and current payments are higher than the new payments will be um and there's no evidence of issues making uh, there's no sorry there's, they can evidence there are no issues making current payments so i can either repeat that or if you're good with it please I think we we need an answer. Uh, Do you want me to jump on that, Aaron? Um, So it it falls onto what we were saying about the mortgage prison side of things. So again, there is the appetite to look at it. If we can can see, if we we can get a proven track issue, so lenders might be sitting on the SVR, and that SVR can range from five, six to nine percent, depending on the lender and depending on on who uh, on what they had beforehand. Um, so going outside a standard affordability model um, is we are regulated. There are elements of, biz- of things that we have to look at. And if we do things outside of standard policy, we do need to report that. And then the regulator does need to come in and have a look and just uh, from time to time and make sure that we're not taking too many risks. But that kind of scenario where you can demonstrate it, um, we can look at the case as a whole and and look at it and say, well, the affordability is there or thereabouts. They haven't been eating into loads and loads of savings. They haven't been paying, uh, they haven't gone from 10 grand in credit to two grand overdrawn on their bank account. Nothing is financially distressed. Um, And actually, if we were to look at it on a, Um, an affordability model based on the monthly payments that our mortgage would take it it passes then yes we might be able to look at it Um, again this is really where from us we look at it on a manual basis and try and see if we can build it and again sometimes there might be other options where we may not need to go down that route because they might have something else in the background that might all of a sudden help things out they might only have a in my example I talked about somebody with a £300,000 pension fund which is quite a lot of money um, not everyone's necessarily got that. They might only have 50 grand. But what that might do is that 50 grand, which they go, oh, that's nothing, I don't need it. Well, we can use that today, add that in, and maybe do a 10-year interest-only mortgage. That's an extra four, five, four or five grand's worth of income. And then all of a sudden, that fits, and you're not a mortgage prisoner. As long as you're old enough to be able to draw on in it, over 55, for example, for SIPs and things like that, let's use it and add it in today. And then we don't, then the client's, getting the right mortgage with the right advice um, and without necessarily needing to go down an exception route. But yes, we can have a look at them on that anyway. So always happy to look at. Excellent. Okay, we are sort of approaching fairly fairly near the um, the closing time, but I think, you know, we've probably got a little time for another couple of questions that we've we've been asked. So if you guys can just stay on that, would be great. So I think we'd like to get these questions answered. So, do, you, do your interest-only mortgages have to be affordable by each person on the mortgage? Uh, we've been asked here. Uh, essentially, no. Um, it's what I described earlier um, when we're talking about a Rio mortgage. So, um, you know, as, as, as I said in one of the slides, um, a Rio mortgage has to have what you would, what we commonly call the death stress, um, and, and that is if one person were to pass away. Um, meaning that the, the, the person that remains, um, they need to demonstrate affordability uh, for that total mortgage. Often that's the problem. Uh, you do need joint borrowing uh, or joint incomes um, and, you know, things such as pension transfers. Uh, whilst there might there might be some, there's, it's not an automatic and it might not be to the full value. So that's where a lot of these drop away, um, but then they will fall into just a standard interest only mortgage, uh, which is what Nathan uh, was talking about there. So yes, we can go to 80% or 70%, depending on whether uh, what repayment vehicle there are, 
But to answer the question, no, we just need to see that it's affordable as the application is presented to us at that time. Um, and, and with the fact that we do have quite a, we do have long open-ended um, or sorry, fixed ended, but long terms that we can offer for interest only, um, it, it tends to do the trick. Um, but uh, no, we don't need to demonstrate affordability in, in, in sole names, that's an advantage. Brilliant. Okay. Right. We've got, so with just, we have got another um, interest only question as well. So I'm just going to put that on as the last one, because obviously we've got running over time a little bit, but all good. So will you do a pure interest only calculation for affordability? We've been asked here. Nathan, sorry, uh, just want to, yeah, seen it. Just on mute. Apologies. Uh, yeah. you, you, you think after a couple of years of COVID and things like this, we'd be used to it, used to it by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do it all the time. Um, so, so yes, we can look at um, for terms of ten years or less. We will base it on um, an interest only style style stress. And um, we'll still look. There's still obviously mentions of affordability caps and things like that because you'll need to be mindful um that we're not putting that client into a hundred times their income or anything crazy like that but um what you are looking at is 10 years or less we will apply a more generous calculation um anything 10 years or more will be deemed for us anyway is the same way as a normal capital on interest mortgage so what we tend to find is if somebody wants maybe 12 13 years on interest only chances are they're going to get a significantly better result by looking at a 10 year and what that really does as well is it builds in a review for that client and their circumstances purely because if you go back quite a few years lots of people had interest only mortgages they are coming to fruition now they may have paid off the endowment or cashed it in and that might be the car that's on the driveway um or they may have just said i don't need to worry about it <laughs> don't need to worry about the mortgage for a while I'll, I'll worry about that later on and now they're in that scenario where they can't do anything so by doing things like a 10-year um, interest only stress they can get the money they need and just have to review it on a more regular basis to just make sure it's still kind of right for their needs and suitable for them which kind of falls in quite nicely with things like consumer duty now where you really need to make sure that you are overseeing the current circumstances and this is the right thing for them to do now and in the future um okay gentlemen right we are going to wrap it up there but we do have a fair a fair number of questions um again that have come through that uh, perhaps um, we'll be able to put to you later on and then perhaps in because um, obviously there's a lot of people watching this and a lot of people have really enjoyed it there's a lot of questions coming through as I said so we may well um, in the future ask you the questions that, um, that have come to us and maybe we'll put something up in mortgage solutions uh, in the future to give people the answers they want but um, obviously a fascinating discussion which a lot of people have engaged with and uh, uh, excellent presentation. So thank you very much for everyone who has uh, viewed it. We will also put the recording up on uh, Mortgage Solutions as well. So again, thank you very much. And thank you, Darren. And thank you, Nathan. And uh, have a good day.